has been happening since Adam and Eve. It's not significant. But no, the word Alma always means a virgin. And this shows us that our Blessed Mother, we correctly always use ever Virgin Mary, Blessed Virgin Mary. The early writers, the Christian writers, always connected, used our Blessed Mother with Virgin Mary at the Council of Nicaea in 325. The Blessed Virgin Mary, born of the Virgin Mary, always used her as a virgin. We also have, this coincides with in the Gospel of St. Luke, where when Our Lady said, when the angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bear a son. Thou, so Saint, we read in, in, in this St. Luke, the angel Gabriel sent to the Virgin Mary, and he came to the Virgin and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Mary pondered what manner of greeting this might be. St. Gabriel says, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. The angel Gabriel is merely repeating Isaiah 7.14. So after the angel tells Mary this, she says, How shall this happen? Since I know not man. Now she was already betrothed. She was already betrothed to St. Joseph. So how do we explain this quote? St. Augustine says there is no other way you can explain it but that she had a vow of virginity. She was resolved to know not man. I mean, if you don't, she was a, a spouse to Joseph, then there would be no question. Now the interesting thing too, we look at the Gospel of St. Matthew, and St. Matthew's Gospel is written for the converted Jews. So St. Matthew, he, he dwells on, very interestingly, St. Matthew dwells on the <clears throat> quotes from Scripture showing that Jesus is the Messiah. St. Matthew, of his Gospel, he quotes more from the Old Testament than Mark, Luke, and John because he's writing for the converted Jews. Now, St. Matthew begins his Gospel with a genealogy of Christ. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, etc., etc. And then he says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Christ. Now, notice he does not say Joseph begot Jesus. Absolutely not. To show Mary was a virgin and Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost. But the interesting thing is people may say, why did St. Matthew do the genealogy of Joseph? Joseph was only the foster father. Why did he do that? Well, the Jews always did that. He was, St. Matthew was writing for the Jews. But secondly... It was, the, it was the, the way that the Jews did it. You always married within your tribe. So the very fact that Joseph was a spouse to Mary shows that they were both of the line of David. No question about that. The Jews understood that. There's no doubt. But also we know that uh, St. Luke gives the genealogy of our Blessed Mother in a different way, that she was of the house of David, as it had been foretold. Now, interestingly... <clears throat> We have the case where sometimes people say Protestants who don't know beans from buckshot, they try to say that Mary had other children. So they're talking about, you know, the, the brethren of the Lord. Well, this is the interesting thing, mm. is that when we read in the Gospel of St. John, <clears throat> chapter 19, and the verses, uh, I think it's uh, 17 on, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. There is an excellent book written by uh, this Francisco Suarez. He was a Jesuit. He wrote 450 years ago. It's the Blessed Virgin Mary, the divine maternity and the virginity of the Blessed Virgin. Unbelievable, his knowledge of Scripture. But he shows that the brethren of the Lord were our Lord's cousins. So... Who is Mary of Colophus that says it's the mother, it's the, the sister, 
Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, Mary, blessed virgin, and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas. One of the explanations is this. We have St. Joachim and St. Anne. And they give birth to Our Lady, Mother of God. And as we read in Matthew, Jacob begot Joseph. But he also begot Cleophas. And Cleophas married Mary. And she is the mother of these, the brethren of the Lord. And then obviously, Mary was betrothed to St. Joseph, and, and Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. But this, this Franciscus Suarez, I mean, I could do it, it, it'd take a long time to explain, but he just goes through one quote after another after another, talking about Salome and Mary Colophis and Mary Magdalene and this Mary and that Mary, and he dissects it very thoroughly and says there's no way this is pertaining to the Blessed Virgin Mary, these other children. I want to share one other thing with you, and I, I mentioned it last year. Maybe seven, eight years ago, in Time and Newsweek magazine, they came out with this big, huge article. Some archaeologist, supposedly archaeologist, found the tomb of James, and it said, James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus, written in Hebrew on that. And they were, boy, they're going like crazy. Look at this. You Catholics thinking she was a virgin, you're wrong. The Protestants saying, yeah, we've been saying that for years. A couple months later, the Israeli police raided that archaeologist's home, found out that he was making these things himself. He was constructing these, 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 these stone tombs, and he chiseled, he chiseled that himself. Complete fraud. And you know the interesting thing? Did Time or Newsweek ever write a retraction? No. The error and the, and the, the, the things against Our Lady and against Our Lord were already out there. No need to correct it. No, you're never going to hear a correction or retraction. No. That guy was arrested for a fraud perpetrating that this supposedly happened. That's the reason why I want to tell you this. It is muy importante. So a little bit of my Spanish. Very important that when you hear something and it sounds like it contradicts the faith, you have to know there's another explanation, that you're not getting the whole story or they're making this up or it's not true and don't swallow it. I'm going to give another example, and that is with regard to, <clears throat> we are talking about this in a sermon when we think of Our Lady's divine maternity, it's very interesting that when the Council of Ephesus spoke of the divine maternity of Mary condemning Nestorius, and when we think of the term Theoktokos, the mother of God, this is not something that was new. They had the concept all along from the very beginning. And this is why I want to reiterate it is so important when we talk to Protestants, we not only go toe-to-toe -to -toe on Scripture, which we can, but we also cover historical fact. The historical fact is this. I mean, I talk to Protestants and say, you know what, we can go back and forth on Scripture. I'd be glad to do it. I'll answer any of your questions. We'll get the Bible out. We'll go through it. Good. But you know what? You're in Wonderland, Mr. or Mrs. You're in Wonderland. You jump from Christ and the Bible, the here I am and this is, I'm the church. Who do you think you're kidding? What was the church after Jesus ascended into heaven? Who was there? It was a bunch of people toting a Bible and having a, having, having a beard and having a Bible and John Deuce and that, that. No. They didn't even have Bibles back then. Most people didn't even have a Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles written, obviously at different times. They were used by the early Christians. The early fathers of the church quoted from them, but the average Joe the average man or woman who was a Christian and Catholic did not have a Bible. The Bible was handwritten. Most people didn't have a Bible to the 1400s. How did they learn the faith? And you have to ignore, you know, I was talking to this one Protestant, I mean, like a week ago. I told her, St. Peter, fact, he went from Jerusalem to Antioch to Rome. He died 67 A.D. on the Vatican Hill, Nero Circus, crucified upside down, uh, you know, June 29th, 67. Constantine, with the presence of Pope 
Sylvester, St. Sylvester, exhumed his body and built the first St. Peter's on that spot. Later on, in the 1400s, that first construction of St. Constantine had to come down. They, d- they built the present-day Vatican. St. Peter had successors. We can point Linus, Anacletus, Clement. There's, we have the writings of St. Clement still around, just like we have the early Christian writers. St. Ignatius of Antioch in 107, he lived around 107 A.D. He was using the word Catholic even back then. Secular sources will tell us these facts. I said, you know, you Protestants, you're jumping from Jesus, the Bible, and here I am. What about the history? We look at the lineage of the popes. We can look at the, the councils of the church. You have to ignore all that like it didn't even exist. It wasn't even there. Crazy. So, you know, if our, as we were saying in the sermon, Henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. The angel Gabriel said, Mary is full of grace and blessed among all women. And you know, there's another quote our Saint Elizabeth said to Our Lady. But I, before I get into that, do you remember in the Gospel of Saint Luke, Jesus was preaching and doing all these wonderful things. This one woman from the crowd cried out and says, blessed is the womb that bore thee and the breast that nursed thee. And Jesus said, yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Protestants are like, oh, no, see, he didn't like that. He didn't want to hear that. No. Our Lady was indeed blessed because she was the mother of God, but she also walked the walk and talked the talk. She did the will of God because St. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, says, and blessed is she who has believed because the things promised her by the Lord should be accomplished. Our Blessed Mother is indeed blessed, be the mother of God, but she also merited by her her humility and her obedience and her love of God. And we also think of all the sorrows and sufferings she under, endured as the mother of God, from the prophecy of Simeon to the, the flight into Egypt and the loss of Jesus in the temple and Jesus carries his cross and she stood, she stood at the foot of the cross. I'd like to share a real brief thing with you. And I, I, I think, you know, when Protestants bash us and say, oh, you shouldn't be honoring Mary and it detracts from Christ. No, not at all. Scripture is contrary to what they try to interpret. I remember talking to this one Protestant woman, and she just didn't get it. I mean, everything I'm saying, and even more, didn't get it, didn't get it, didn't get it. Well, finally, Mel Gibson came out with his movie, The Passion of the Christ. She saw that movie, and she had a a major meltdown when Jesus is carrying his cross, and Our Lady goes up to, to meet Jesus on the way, And she told me, after seeing that movie, she says, I get it. Like, yeah, what? (laughs) I mean, you know, you ever have somebody come up to you and thinks that you know what they're thinking and jumps right into the middle of the story and is like, what are you talking about, lady? I have no clue. She says, I get it. Bishop, I get it. Lady, what do you get? She says, I understand. Understand what? You know about Mary. What about Mary. Well, you know, when Jesus was dying in there, that she was there, I never, ever even thought what would it be like as being a mother and seeing your son suffer these things. But that's when you jump in and say, just as Eve approached the the tree of the forbidden fruit, so Mary approaches the tree of the cross. The wisdom of God to humble Satan, what Eve had cooperated, Mary reverses in her cooperation with our redemption. So we can go on and on and on and on. It's almost noon. But I just wanted to say, just in general, uh, when we think of our Blessed Mother, as we're saying in the sermon, we want to repeat it, how important it is that we have a love and a devotion to her. We try to imitate her. We wear her scapular, pray her rosary, and we do our very, very best to stay close to her in these difficult times. The church is going through a crucifixion. Now, uh, where is that Jacinta Rosary? Somewhere around here? It, okay, hey, they're going out the front door. Stop them right now. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, it's still there. Make sure, make sure it's in the box there. We don't have a, I get an empty box to go back to them all. Oh, it's, it's gone, okay? <laughs> so just wanted to ask uh, briefly if anybody has any questions. And we know sometimes people send in uh, notes and stuff like that, but I uh, want to just open up for questions here.
Uh, some of you might have questions, maybe. Yes. Okay, she's asking for what is the best book to present to Protestants. It's not in the bookstore, but we have recopied this a jillion times. It's called Christian Denominations. And what's good about this book, it's a very small booklet, maybe 120 pages. Easy reading. But what this Catholic priest does is he goes from Scripture, then goes into the early fathers of the church, so what the early Christians believed, then he goes through history, then he goes through the councils of the church, then he goes through, you know, the history of these other denominations. I mean, you could pinpoint it was always the Catholic church. There were breakoffs like Arianism and Nestorianism, and then you get these other heresies. But the big, next big breakoff was 1054 with the Greek Orthodox, the schism. And then after that was 1517 with Luther, and then 1534 with Henry VIII. And then you got all these other denominations branching off from there. So it's a very, very good book. It's concise. You know, where's Father Radecki's are here? Okay, we'll put a plug in. They have written a heck of a book, but you hand somebody a book that thick, they think, oh, thanks a lot. Like, <laughs> so it's great for reference and great for looking things up. But would I, I'd be a little bit hesitant to hand somebody. How many page book is that, Father? What's that? 760 pages. Say, hey, read this and we'll talk about it. You're like, oh. <laughs> In this day and age where people want things to the point, concise, etc., be brief, be bright, and be gone. So I, that's a really, really good book. And when I, uh, during the summer, I go to different parishes and we teach for a week. We have adult catechism class. We give that book out to a lot of people. And then he goes into Lutheranism and Anglicanism, and he goes through all these different sects, where they came from, what they believe, etc. give you this example. This is pretty interesting. There's a Catholic girl who fell in love <laughs> with this, uh, this Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, so you can't go to church on Sunday. You've got to go to church on Saturday. Sunday's man-made. So I said, okay. Let's just imagine this for a second. Uh, when does Seventh-day Adventist start? Oh, 1800s, okay. You're telling me that from Christ to the 1800s, the Christian church has got it wrong for 1,800 years, and then this joker comes along and says, hey, you've been doing it wrong, this is the way it is. Christ said, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. If this is such an important issue that we're supposed to go on Saturday, like the Old Testament said, not Sunday, if this is so important, then how in the heck did Christ allow his church to make such a big blunder? No way. Secondly, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. St. Peter established Sunday, especially Easter Sunday, as the day of the resurrection. It's the Lord's Day, Sunday. And the, the early Christian churches went on Sunday, not Saturday. He kept saying, man, law, man, law, man, law. I said, God said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. He who hears you hears me. Do you get that? So it's, it's interesting. But that is a, Christian Domination is a really, really good book. You know, there's a number of books in the, in the uh, bookstore there that I highly recommend that would be very, very good uh, and good for reference, too. But I think uh, there's so many of them. I would just like to say for all of you, uh, if we look at especially encyclicals, uh, there's some really, really good encyclicals there. We do not have a Holy Father. We don't have a Pope today to guide us. Is exactly what Saint or Pope Leo the Thirteenth said in his prayer to Saint Michael, they the enemies of the church have the iniquitous design to strike the shepherd and scatter the sheep. But you know, when we read the encyclicals of the popes, these are treasuries. They're just so full of scripture. The early Christian writers, the fathers and doctors of the church, the councils of the church. These are just overwhelming a wealth of information of Catholic information. Good stuff on so many different topics. 
Uh, I have a five-volume set of all the encyclicals of all the popes, but those individual things, when you read those encyclicals, very, very enlightening. So any other questions here? Yes. Okay, good question. She's asking about organ donation. Now, first and foremost, we'd like to just say this. When it comes to medical moral ethics, you're going to find that there have been in the past different opinions. That's, that's not to be like, oh my gosh, they don't get along, they don't agree. I gave you some examples. Uh, maybe everyone here is you know, pretty much an adult, young adult. Okay, uh, one example was the issue with a woman having repeated cesarean you know, births. Uh, the question came up if a woman's uterus or womb was so damaged that it presented a danger if she got pregnant in the future, can her uterus be removed? A number of theologians, one of them being Father Francis Connell, if you ever get the odd sum, we quote from him often and give you know, his different questions and answers in the back of the odd sum seminary newsletter. He said, no, you can't remove the uterus because it would be a contraceptive measure. The danger is only there. Uh, the danger is only there if she becomes pregnant. But outside of that, there's no reason to remove it. And there was a number of other theologians who said the same thing. On the other hand, there were other theologians who said it's a damaged organ; it can be removed. And there's some theologians are saying there's argument. There's good arguments on both sides. You know, good arguments on both sides, and uh, it's 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 probable that they're both acceptable. So. There is another example, and I'll be discreet, but uh, Canon 1068 talks about impediments to marriage, physical impediments to marriage. And so there was a procedure uh, that if it was permanent, it would make a, a person incapable, uh, a man incapable of, of conceiving children or whatever, that he was not allowed to get married. But there was the, the, the procedure was a definite procedure, and there was a, di- there was a distinction between the rota the department in Rome under the Pope who made marriage decisions about validity and annulments and stuff. Then he had the Holy Office about the you know, the defense of the faith. They were on two different pages. The Rhoda said, if somebody gets married and they have this, if a man had this procedure, it's an invalid marriage. The Holy Office was saying, wait a minute. For this to be an impediment, it has to be antecedent to the marriage and perpetual. We don't know if this procedure is perpetual, meaning if it can't be reversed. Rhoda was saying, hey, we know of no procedure. Medical information tells us this cannot be reversed, so that it's an invalid marriage. Holy Office is saying, even though there's no procedure to exist today, that doesn't mean it's not reversible. So that second part of Canon 1068 said, in doubt of fact or law, Marriages to be allowed. You have two different departments under a true pope, Pope Pius XII, and it's all a matter of fact of this or that. Now, we had a case come up about 15 years ago, family uh, in Arizona, and their baby was going to be born with hyperplastic left heart syndrome. The baby was going to die. They already had a case like that a couple years before that, lost a child. So I asked Dr. Ramakrumara Swami, you know Dr. Ramakrumaswamy is traditional Catholic. He was a cardiovascular surgeon and professor at, I think, Albert Einstein Medical School in New York or whatever. I asked him what he thought, and he said, as far as he's concerned, brain dead is dead. I, asked, I also act, talked to a number of other professional people. These are traditional Catholics. that said brain dead is dead. But on the other hand, I know there's people that say brain dead is not dead. So this, I'm, I'm going to just tell you what I said is that I'm not the Pope. I can't make a definitive decision one way or the other. Okay? I'm not the Pope to say, you know, I just want to say this. For those clergy who say brain dead is not dead, then you should forbid the sacraments to anyone who's an organ donor. And, and, and I don't know if you're in a position to make that decision. So I know this is going to, like, your question probably can open up a can of worms, but I'm just saying on my part that it, that's one of the problems. We don't have a true pope today. So there's, there's two opinions about that. Pope Pius XII did touch upon this in 1957. He addressed these anesthesiologists, and he said it's up to the, the doctor, and especially the anesthesiologist, to determine dead and brain dead and all this stuff. So 
my opinion is I can't make a decision. I'm not a bishop. I'm not infallible. And, you know, the Pope, Pope Pius XII, even made it, said that it was up to the doctor to figure that out. I can't. Would I be an organ donor? No. I, I would not be an organ donor myself. Yeah, well, I think that that's allowed. But we're talking about other such things, you know, that, that brain dead thing is a, is a very hot issue. There was a theologian in the 1950s. His name is Father O'Donnell. He was in his 90s, maybe 10 years ago, and he was one of the leading theologians, you know, and he is quoted in a medical moral ethics that we book that we use the seminary, and he was convinced that brain dead, especially the brain stem, total brain dead is dead. That's his opinion. Am I saying he's right? No, don't know. But that was his opinion. So my, my, my point in saying about medical moral ethics is this. It's a very, very difficult subject because there are different opinions. And until the Pope, a Pope, a true Pope, makes an infallible decision on something, we can have our opinion, but that's about it. Yes, in the back there. Go ahead. Well, this is, yeah, but this is, this is what the other side, I'm not arguing with you, I'm just saying this is what the other side says. The other side says is that they do what they call the apnea test. The apnea test is that it's machines that are mechanically keeping things circulating, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Krumaraswamy said the, with the apnea test, what they're, like a billow, they're adding air and removing air. They're keeping things chemically going. But when the apnea test, when they remove those things, things drop, it shows that it's being mechanically done. I'm not arguing with you. I'm not arguing with Dr. Krumaswamy. I'm just saying what he said. So as far as I'm concerned, will I be a donor? No. But am I going to say, by the authority that I do not have, you cannot do this. I don't have the authority to do that. I could have an opinion. I, I, I hear arguments on both sides. But I'm going to be really careful about shooting from the hip and saying, this is exactly what it is. You're going to follow me because I said so. And you know, when I was talking to Dr. Kurumaswamy, I mean, he's a cardiovascular, insur- he was a cardiovascular surgeon, very educated. He knew the topic. He knew the, he knew the facts and figures and all this stuff. Who am I to say, yeah, no, you're wrong. You don't know what the heck you're talking about. So, and, 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 you know, I would have to be, I'd have to do this. I'd have to back, basically say, even though there's no pope to make a decision on this, in my opinion, you're wrong, and therefore I'm going to deny you the sacraments, and you can't have that opinion. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable going there. So your question was a good question, and I was even thinking, you know, if, this, if it opens a can of worms, I'm just telling you what I think. And what I think is, is that when it comes to these medical moral eth- issues and stuff like that, it's the same thing with life support. You know, how much life support is necessary? Uh, the, the medical moral ethics book that we use, it talks about we have the obligation, according to the fifth commandment, to take the ordinary means to preserve life. What's extraordinary? Extreme pain, extreme expense, uh, extreme inconvenience, with no hope of success. So I'll give you an example, and that was the case with Terry Schiavo. How many remember Terry Schiavo? Florida case. Okay. <clears throat> Terry Schiavo had an accident. We don't know how it happened, but, you know, she was somewhat vegetal, but she could function. And they took her off of the food and hydration. I disagreed with that. I think that that was wrong. To insert a, a tube in the stomach is not extraordinary means. But I believe Father Chikata, who I have the greatest respect for, Father Chikata, and also I think Bishop Sanborn, both were of the opinion they didn't have to put a fooding tube in, and she could die of dehydration and starvation because, uh, you know, that's extraordinary means. Uh, I didn't agree with that. Well, okay. Okay, well, I'm, okay. I'm just saying that that's the position they took. I didn't agree with it because extraordinary means extreme pain, extreme expense, and all the other things, and that's just not 
what really, like 100 years ago or 200 years ago, would have been extraordinary is not extraordinary today. I mean, there's people. I know we have girls' camp. We have over 100 kids. There's so one girl. She's on a feeding tube in her stomach. So her mom would come, and I mean, she didn't eat the other food that the kids ate. Her mom just injected something in her stomach, and she was out there playing, you know, back to playing and stuff like that. They say in the United States about 100,000 people are on a feeding tube. So do I think a feeding tube is extraordinary? No. But it gets into areas, I'm just going to say, my opinion is ordinary things would be food and hydration. And one other thing, too, just with regard to hospice, we had an unfortunate case in one of our parishes, won't say where, but the man was involved with the VA, and the VA put him on hospice. And what they were doing is they weren't, you have some nurse or some aide who's taking care of him, wouldn't really feed him. There was times where he looks uncomfortable. You now, not to, you know, beat around the bush, and, but, you know, what, what was actually happening was he would get constipated, so he was very un- uncomfortable, and his wife would give him food to make him regular. When he had a bowel movement, he felt great. But the nurses and stuff didn't know him, so they thought, he's uncomfortable, he's dying, start giving him morphine. I told her, you better get him out of that place, bring him home, you better do that, and you better do it soon. Well, she would go there and feed him. So what those people did is they went to a doctor, and they went and got a court order that she was forbidden to feed him. And then they said, well, you know, we've got to make him comfortable because he's dying. And some, they were trying to, they told her, it's the dying process. Our, one of our prisoners who was in that parish, she's a nurse. She's not dying. It takes a little bit more time to feed him. But he'll, he'll, with, you know, with gusto, he'll swallow it down. He wants to eat. I mean, he had a little bit of Alzheimer's, et cetera. But he didn't die because of whatever they said he had. It wasn't the process taking place. I mean, for that, all that matter, we're all dying. We're all in the dying process. Yeah, I mean, when the day we're born, we're in a dying process. But my point is, is that he died because he didn't have hydration. He died because he didn't have food. And the court would forbid her. I mean, they would have her arrested. If she tried feeding them, they'd have her arrested. And it, and it was a really lousy situation. So my, my point is, is that these are difficult times in which we live. And unfortunately, you know, for some of these things, the law gets involved and then we're, we're, then we're in trouble. So got to be very, very careful uh, in, in those areas. Any other questions? Yes. We we reprinted it, so we can we can, if you want to order one, okay. that up there. That's not free. <laughs> <laughs> and now that you ask and you want one, the price has gone up too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Say that again, I'm sorry. There's a judgment, a personal judgment immediately after you die. Christ takes the judgment when you have and haven't done what you need to do to do it. Now, if we okay, so if we can't answer these questions, you know, that seem to look at you. So the question that I have are maybe what we need to do is depend on him and be satisfied with that. Well, it, 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 I'm going to, can I give, we're going to open this up even further. I'm going to be real quickly about this. If you stop and think of the, the, those who call themselves traditional Catholics today, we, we don't believe that the, there's a true pope. The chair is vacant. Okay? There's no way public manifest heretics can be pope. They're not even members of the church. Then there's others who say, well, he's the pope and he remains the pope even if he goes into heresy. And that's Bishop Snyder and uh, and, and those who are conservative, but Novus Ordo. The Sai St. Pius X, he's teaching heresy, but he's still the Pope. You have Bishop Sanborn, who believes he's materially the Pope, meaning he's been lawfully elected, and therefore he's holding that position, and you cannot replace him. No way can anybody else be elected because he's been truly elected, but because he doesn't, because of his false teachings, God has not given him the authority. So, 
kind of materially pope, but not formally the pope. So there's such a variety. I'll give you an example. I mean, we can go into other things. A lot of priests today who would not follow the, the, the liturgy of Pope, Saint, or pope Pius XII. If I think Father, did Father Benedict talk, speak about that in his lecture on the liturgy? Did he talk about it? I don't know. Okay, but there's priests who say, well, no, 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 what Pope Pius XII did was not lawful. Our position is he's a legitimate pope. He lawfully made these changes. And as Vatican Council I says, you know, we declare that the, 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 the authority of the apostolic see is to be reviewed by no one. No one can sit in judgment of the decisions of the apostolic see. If he's the pope, it's not for me to say, well, I'll take this, but I won't take that. I'll accept this, but I won't accept that. No, you've got to take the whole shebang. So there's, there's a lot of different opinions out there. And that's where Satan knew exactly. Strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. And, and we can get into areas like the heliocentric and geocentric theory. Does the, all the planets go around the earth, or does all the planets go around the sun? Is the, the earth the center of everything or whatever? There's people that want to fight you over that. Boy, they're grrr, and want to get into it with you. And I'm like... All right, there's, there's opinions. Are we going to fight about everything? You know, what are we going to So the important thing is that we look to the church and say, okay, what does the church teach? What is the Catholic view on this? We can have strong opinions, but it's not like, I think, when it comes to some things, we can say, you're damned, you're a heretic, you're no good. Da, 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 da. Uh, we have to be careful about that. Heather, in the back there, is that Heather? Yes. Well, this is the thing. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to repeat again that Pope Pius XII said we make a distinction between the life of individual organs and the whole system working and coordinating together. I mean, the, the, it, is, it was his address to the anesthesiologist in 1957, and that's what Dr. Krumaswamy was quoting. So listen, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to say what he said and there are opinions out there. Am I going to be an organ donator? I'm not. Anyone want my organs anyway? <laughs> yes. Yes, as long as it's not more than half. And I got to tell you a quick story. The blessing of holy water is kind of a long blessing. Got to bless the salt. Exercise the thought. Bless the thought. Exercise the water. Bless the, bless the water. Mix the salt into the water. Final prayer. So a long and a long process. Well, one of our priests, Father Clement Kubish, uh, when I was in seminary, he was a great priest, told a lot of great stories. He said this woman kept bringing every Sunday gallons and gallons of them be blessed with holy water. And you know, he gladly does it, but come on, how much holy water do you need? <laughs> it was every Sunday. So he finally said, what's going on here? I mean, a couple gallons every, every week, she says, makes the best coffee. <laughs> okay, no more coffee, okay? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay, you want to know about John the 23rd? Well, my opinion is that he was a part of the whole situation to destroy the church. And interestingly, the magazine out of Rome, 30 Days, it's translated into six languages, they interview everybody. And they interviewed this grand master mason of Italy, back in the 90s. And they said, what is your relationship with the church, you know, the Catholic church? And this grand master Mason who just got elected says, oh, we we welcome with open arms prelates. He said, in fact, we have reason to believe that Ron Kali, John XXIII, he was initiated in Istanbul when he was apostolic delegate there and that when he was in Paris, he frequented our lodges in Paris. I find that very interesting. He also was the one who said, we don't need to know about the third secret of Fatima. Not necessary, don't need to know it. He called for Vatican II, and as Archbishop Lefebvre had witnessed himself, all the preliminary work to get ready for Vatican II, right before Vatican II, they said, okay, we're not going to talk about this. 
this is the new stuff. And they were well organized to railroad their, their agenda, the new agenda with Vatican II. So, and then he, right off the bat, makes Montini a cardinal, loads the deck, makes sure Martini is going to get in, etc. So you, you have to see this as this not happen by accident. It all's connected together. So uh, I, don't think he was a tr- I don't think he was a true pope. I think that he was a part of the infiltration within the church to destroy it from within. Uh, that's just that's my opinion. So even that's an op- opinion. You know, there's something John the 23rd, something Paul VI, and it's just, it, there are many, many opinions out there. And, and, and that's where we have to be careful to do our best to, we can maintain our opinions and, and et cetera, et cetera. But insofar, to me, insofar as the issue with the papacy is concerned, and this is the, one of the most dividing issues, is he the Pope, is he not the Pope? The bottom line is, what does the church teach? Pope Innocent III said, if the pope falls into heresy, he loses a position. Pope Paul IV in 1559 says, cum exabatus officio, he says, if a man has fallen away from the faith or deviated from the faith before his election, it's an invalid election. And he says, nor can it become valid through subsequent you know, operating within that office or position. It, everything he's done is invalid. Canon law says this is on the uh, election for the validity of election. He has to be a male, baptized, and capable of receiving the jurisdiction and exercising the authority of the office. To me, that condition there eliminates the concept that somebody could be elected, but he's only materially the pope. He's chosen and he occupies that position materially, but not formally, where he, he's part pope, he's been elected, but he doesn't have the authority, so he's not speaking infallibly. And just a little bit of more on that position, those who hold the material pope position, they say that the only way things can get reconciled is if Francis says, okay, I was wrong, I didn't get it right, I believe in the Catholic faith, and bingo, he becomes pope. That's their solution. That is, that's the only way it's going to happen. Or if one of the Novus Ordo bishops makes the warnings and does all that stuff and says he's not the Pope, but, you know, things have been so derailed, so radically derailed, that you have, because of the ordination and consecration of bishops and such, that being, you know, invalidated in 1968, these men are not priests, they're not bishops. I mean, they have, to me, that is a completely different church. It's not the Catholic Church. Uh, whatever. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. It's okay. Would I jump up and down? <laughs> Sister, get the eraser, raise the price of that book up there. <laughs> oh, is it a great book? Oh, I want everyone in this place to buy it. Yes. The holy water, it makes good coffee. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Why don't you go try it? Oh yeah, it, it does work. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, yes. You, you, when you bless yourself with holy water, that is very beneficial, etc. Like there are many things that, like saying the Our Father. You know, we say the Our Father, but that also can remit sins etc., venial sins, etc., so a lot of beautiful things that are, you know, indulgenced or this or that, etc. And let's remember with the indulgences, it's not 300 days out of purgatory, it's 300 days of what was equivalent to penance in the early church. Cho. Yes? Well, just one more thing. I would just say this. People think, oh, if that happens, it's going to sink the church. That modern church is oiling in the bottom of the water. I mean, you could look down there and see if the water's clear enough, you could see Francis and all those people down. They're already sunk, okay? It's added one more ridiculous thing to the pile. But, you know, let's be clear. Of all the sins that offend God, the most offensive are those that deal with God directly, the first three commandments. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Remember, you know, to uh, 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Keep holy the Lord's day. Those pertain to God. The very first one, we should worship the true God and not worship false gods. So for a neon sign for the last 50 years, <clears throat> they've been advertising, this is not the true church. We believe and recognize all the other churches. This is not the true church, etc. You know, it's, it's clear. So now when he says well, adulterers can go to communion in his apostolic uh, exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, oh my gosh, people are like, that's so horrible. It's bad. It's a sacrilege. He's, well, he's, but before that, he said, France, uh, John Paul II said he can give communion to Protestants. Canon uh, 843 of the New Code. <clears throat> before that, it was like, you know, we can practice ecumenism. And we recognize the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims. Supposedly, the church looks with steam upon the Muslims. <coughs> that goes in 1965. So it's just one more part of the destruction of the name of Catholicism. It's disgracing the name of Catholicism. Cho, listen, somebody think of a question so I could drink this water here because my throat is really dry. Father Benning. Okay, yes. <clears throat> well, I would I, I, I think what we just say is is this. There are Jews today who try to practice the Old Testament. And this is interesting, but the point you make is because John Paul II has said their covenant, the Old Testament, is still valid for them. So they can reject Jesus, reject the new and eternal covenant. And they are still pleasing to God and acceptable by God. And Rattinger, when he was cardinal, supposedly cardinal, the, it used to be the Holy Office, now it's the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. They issued a statement saying Christians should not look at the Old Testament too critically, trying to find all these passages that pertain to Jesus. And they shouldn't do that because the more they see these patches, passages, especially the prophecies pertaining to Christ, the more critical they are going to be of the Jews. He said, we don't want to do, we don't be critical of the Jews as if the Jews missed a boat. And like, they have. The Messiah has come. Jesus is the Messiah. But this is the clincher. He says, the messianic expectations of the Jews has not been in vain. That they're still awaiting a Messiah is still not in vain. He says, we, like them, live in waiting the only difference for us is that the Jesus who will come will have the traits of that Jesus who already came. I'm talking about a different Jesus, the Jesus who will come. Just say, Jesus will come again. Don't get this flowery nonsense. No, but he says, we like them, the Jews, wait in expectation, but the Jesus who will come will have this, the traits of that Jesus who already came. Two different people. And I'm thinking, that is utterly preposterous. And the Jews, they are way to Messiah. And when the Antichrist comes, they're going to say, it is he. Jesus in the Gospel of St. John says, I come in the name of my Father. And Jesus worked miracles. And they said, we reject him. But Jesus says, but if another one comes in his own name, you're going to say, it's him, it's he. And that's what I think the world's being prepared for even right now. Francis was even talking about the necessity, I don't know, for about saving the environment and ecology, whatever. All the nations of the world need to come together. We need international laws and international governance and all that other stuff. So you can see the modern church is working hand in hand with the globalist to bring about this agenda, all in the name of what they call Catholicism. Well, there's two types of Jews. There's the, the Orthodox and then there's the, uh, the more liberal ones. And I remember I was on a plane one time. Flight attendant came up to me. She said, would you mind switching seats? Because this guy liked to sit next to his wife. I said, sure. I get up, and I'm going to sit next to where he was at, and there's a rabbi there. So I'm sitting next to you know. So he leans over to me and says, my name is Rabbi such and such. You know, pleased to meet you. So we got talking. Interesting. Send us a rabbi. So we get talking. and he says, so... Where's your parish in Omaha? I said, oh, 7 8th and military, Mary Immaculate Church. Hmm, stroking his beard. Yes, like this. 
He said, uh, what's, what, you with the diocese? I said, no. I said, we don't go along with Vatican II because they changed the faith. Mm. You reject all of Vatican II. Yes, yes. I said, do you ever hear of uh, Israel Zoli? No. He recognized the name as being Jewish. Is he going to lecture in Omaha? I know he died, but you ought to look him up. Israel Zoli converted to Catholicism in the 1940s and took Eugenio Zoli. He was the chief rabbi of Rome. So I gave him something to think about. But he was being friendly, and I didn't want to get too much of a fight. And a short, it was a, fl- a short flight. But he gave him a you know, food for thought committee. You know, look up this guy, Israel Zoli. You know, make him start thinking. But he, he, was, he was fairly friendly. But I've been to airports where the Orthodox one with their curls, they see a Catholic priest that spit on the ground. So I mean, they're very, very rigid, uh, etc. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, fathers. T- <laughs> you know I'm going to do this, please. I'll talk to you right after this when Lady Angeles father is getting on my case. Get off my back, father. <laughs> 